I don't like talking about what happened. What happened is still how I refer to it most of the time, and I really don't like talking about it. But the war in Ukraine has been going on for over five years, and it has claimed over 13,000 lives. So I decided that I should talk about it. Of course, those who are near the front line, they suffer the most. But as I've come to learn from my personal experience, even living thousands of miles away from the front line, the war can still affect you. What you're going to hear tonight are all true stories. You'll hear voices of people who took part in the war. Some of them came back, and some didn't. You'll also hear voices of people who lost their loved ones to the war. I tried to put these stories together to make sense of what happened when the war affected me and my family. Lisa and Ira tonight will tell different parts of my own story. Olya will tell a story of a woman who served for three years at the front line, and when she came back, she had to deal with post-traumatic stress disorder. And Uyam and Volodya and the rest of us will perform other parts, all based on true stories. And together, will tell you a little bit about what happened. Tell me what's troubling you. I don't know how to talk about it. Don't worry. It doesn't always work first time. We'll keep trying. До вашої уваги схід сонця через бійницю. Та-та-та-та-та-та. Ту-ту-ту-ту-ту-ту. Да, звісно, камера не може то все показати, ото все, да. Ото у ті всі гори у там. Там все позиції противника. Ото ми з ними воюємо, коротше. От. Ладно, я... Або зараз ще мені телефон пристрілять. Ну, він нахуй. Сука! the corridor where people are waiting with more paperwork. Come out of the building and onto the street. It might take over entire city. If it's not filed. It's better off in the folders where it belongs. There are lots of folders here. They all carefully labeled. Maidan protest, one folder. Power of attorney, one folder. War casualties, one folder. Family members of war casualties, one folder. War veterans, 21 folders. We know many of the names in these folders. Some of them sound familiar. They are the same as names of our relatives, classmates, neighbors, friends, kids. We used to play with when we were growing up. Volodymyr Pius, Sergei Klitschkov, Volodymyr Pavlov, Rostislav Trochansky, Alexander Bosniuk. Other names? We might have heard in news stories, read them online, or even on gravestones. Other still, we've never heard and never will. Now, they're all categorized, sorted, 
and files. To make our lives neater, to give us a sense of order, they are safely under control in the archive. And each one is filed together with its story. Oh, hello there. Yes. I brought some paperwork for you. This is about your brother's case, yeah? Um, yes, about this one. Okay, let's save with me. You can go now. What should I say? So one more person became part of the archive, making one of these 25 folders a little bit thicker, a little bit heavier. His story will be filed together with the rest. Here, yeah, get in touch with the relatives. Um, who's listed as next of kin? Got mother, brother, and sister. Right. Um, do we have numbers for them? Just names and dates of birth, I'm afraid. Oh, great. How am I supposed to find them? Yeah, and uh, I think they live abroad. Oh, even better. Get in touch with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They should have some kind of database. Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Is it okay? No worries. She's on Facebook. What? What would we do without Facebook? Okay. Now, how shall I put it? I can't just tell her what's happened via Facebook. Yes. Um, tell her that the commander wants to get in touch with her mother. Maybe she can call him and he will tell her. Okay. Good afternoon. The commander of 24th Brigade is trying to get in touch with you. Here's his number. Uh, Please call him as soon as you can. Send. Oh. New Facebook request from Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I'll show the name of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. No reply yet. Maybe add her as a friend. No, I think that would be weird. Yes, I know, but maybe she can't see your messages. Um, if you become friends, she will. Okay. What's this? Mama, listen, I'm, I'm not really sure what is going on. It sounds quite serious. Um, and I think it's about, uh -huh, who called you? Commander. Okay. And what do you say? Thank you for getting in touch. My my mom has heard the news already. Sad. I think I've got a reply. Uh, okay. And what did she say? She knows already. Mm, right. Okay. Please accept our condolences. Yes. If you need any help, let us know. Well, 
The problem began when I just got back to work, to my normal job I used to have before the war. I didn't know how to talk. I literally can't talk to anyone about anything. What is it that you find difficult? I don't know how to talk about it. I cry all the time. During those three years of war, I was on the front line. I never cried once. And now, I can start crying for no reason. I keep remembering things. What sort of things? I remember guys. All gone. I can show you. It's in this folder. This folder contains the names of details of two hundreds. It is a code name we use for, how shall we put it? Our casualties, those who were killed in action. When someone is killed, you need to prepare everything and send them home. We had that minibus signed evacuation 200 on it. Sometimes I had to send two 200s per day. Vladislav Pusarenko, Maxim Narizhny, Vadim Lysenko, Volodymyr Yegorenko, Anton Velmoshko, Bogdan Kubisha, Oleksandr Podas, Oleg Novokhatko, Dmitro Samskyi, Volodymyr Petralov. And then, you sit down and write. Each person's death needs investigation. My job was to write it all down. There was not much time during the day, so I did it at night. Half past midnight, 1 a.m. I had to describe exactly how they died. And then I would go to bed. Dmitro Polyvay, Ruslan Bondar, Dmitro Movchan, Roman Kandu, Yaroslav Novosilsky. Дмитро Шматко, Олександр Маладенко, Іван Сенін, Микола Білоцерківець, Євген Волош, Сергій Мосійчук, Віктор Калитич, Петро Козарук, Олексій Струк, Олександр Хараберюш. I remember each one of them. As if I knew that I would never see them again. This must have been very difficult for you. Tell me, what is your worst memory? The worst? The worst? was when, when they bring you things of someone who has just died. And suddenly their phone, it starts ringing. And it rings and rings and there is wife or daughter on it. I never picked up, I couldn't. Sometimes we also had to undress them to see if they had any signs of torture. And I remember when, when that woman came to identify the body of her husband. But there was nothing left of him. Like nothing. I see. Any other memories that bother you? 
I remember. The nurse. When the nurse was killed, that little tiny lady. The explosion tore her body in half. And I just couldn't understand why did she come to the front line. I mean, I knew why I came. I didn't want my husband or my son to be drafted. And they never took more than one person from a family. But why did she come? And here she was in two bags. One small and one slightly bigger. You know, that feeling of guilt of why did she die and I didn't. Sometimes it's not that hard to die on the front line, but it's harder to survive. So you feel guilty because you survived. I see. No, I have to ask you an important question. Have you had any thoughts of, yes, I have. of a suicidal nature? Yes. I had, especially at first time when I just came back. There was time when, you know, you don't care about anything. Can you still think about it? <clears throat> you know, now, now the worst thing is apathy. It's like you simply want to disappear and that's it. I'll give you this homework. Close your eyes. <coughs> now, imagine, make a list of all your negative thoughts, all your fears, your anxieties. And now take a bucket of water, clear, pure water, and wash them all away. So all that's left I can see only black. It's like if someone shut the door. Don't worry. It doesn't always work the first time. We'll keep trying. been showing me dating sites, maternity clothes, theatre performances and animal size 8. It must think that I'm a single woman of reproductive age, kino theatre performances and army outfits. It's all the things that I have pretty big feet. Well, I wouldn't really blame Facebook. I must have spent days looking at army sapphire size hunting for a pair of British army boots. My brother told me that British army boots were the best. British army boots are the best. And they also had to be black, waterproof, lightweight and in size 8. Which proved to be not an easy task. Well, I did find a pair of British army boots that were black and waterproof and in size 8 but they were just too heavy. And the last thing you want when crossing the black earth fields of eastern Ukraine was the way time even before the markets fall off to them. Every day, I checked the main sites to see if they had new additions. I must have inspected 100 pairs of army boots on my laptop screen and not finding what I needed, I started to despair. But then, suddenly, there they were. Gore-Tex Pro Combat British Army Boots. They were black, waterproof, well, slightly on the heavy side, but most importantly, size 8. Oh, I couldn't believe my eyes. By the way, it says size 8 medium. Medium? Medium? I'm really sorry. Um, medium? Have you ever had medium boots? Medium? Uh, can you like, uh, give us advice? Medium? Like, medium. Um, it's very famous. 
eight medium, right? Oh, you sure? Yeah. 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 Luckily, I had no other options available, and I thought that medium must be better than small or large. Plus, they were not pre-owned like the other fans I looked at. They were brand new. So I bought them. I was super happy. My brother would have a brand new pair of British army boots. The end of the whole company. Or even the whole battalion. No one else would have such cool boots. My order arrived pretty quickly. And I was happy to learn that the boots were not too heavy. I got a cloth and I wiped them gently. Remember, there was no need to clean them because they were brand new. And I stroked them gently. And I whispered to them, good luck. And I put the boots back into the box. And the box into the bag. That already contained a full army uniform, a couple of army cups, Army socks, t-shirts, a lightweight waterproof suit, a lightweight trousers and jacket, a helmet liner, a bivy bag, a genuine British Army issue poncho, a few other pieces of army clothing as well as medical supplies, a sealock sachet. Ah, well, a sealock sachet is that stuff that stops the heavy bleeding. Water purifying tablets, dry food survival packs, and lots of chocolates and flapjacks. Well, basically, all the stuff the army doesn't bother to provide for its soldiers. Look, uh, all this should be a good size for him. Yeah, should, should help. Yeah. Well, you know, none of the stuff was particularly hard to get. Actually, that's not true. I was also supposed to get a bulletproof vest, but it just proved to be beyond my abilities. And looking at the large bag, I felt proud for accomplishing my own army mission, getting all the supplies that would keep my brother dry, warm, and safe. Всем привет! Это у нас такая тут позиция, короче. Мы тут в лисе. Видите, как красота. Поездать. село внизу тут озеро це озеро блять там у нас типа укрытие админ там всяких минометов блять О. я так люблю коли така зима Got no honey baby, sugar baby now. I ain't got no honey baby. Вот у село. Там сепаратюга, короче. А тут до них, блядь, 50 метров, блядь. Вот тут мы стреляем, короче, звиц. Село. А там на гурівних там і дошика, і минометы, і пулемети, і короче вся хуйня. Ну, звід... Тут він зараз гуру не покаже, блядь. Як завжди, бронік, каска, рація, блядь.
это как-то хуйня, млят. Сейчас раз зиму вам такую красоту покажу. Их. liner was still there, but now we had a hole and some brownish stains. There were also some condoms in a smaller pocket, and I thought to myself, shit, I should have thought of condoms when I packed the bag two years ago. There was also a book, a weird fantasy book, with a few missing pages. But I guess a weird fantasy is what one needs when the weight of reality gets too much. There was also a phone. It had no lock, no password. I didn't really know if I should open it and go through the pictures and text messages and look at the videos. You see, they, they didn't really belong to me. But then I thought, maybe they can actually tell me something. So I decided I'll take a look at them later. There was also a folder with some paperwork, a short autobiography, a list of next of kin, tickets for the train journeys for war veterans, most of them are news, some military documents, and pictures of sun and rainbows drawn by the school kids, by the soldiers. And then I saw them. Gore-Tex Pro Combat British Army Boots, size 8. They were still in very good shape. I guess now they would qualify as pre-owned. They were covered in mud. Sticky, fertile, Ukrainian black earth. And I took them into the hall of the flat we were staying in. It belonged to a friend of mine who brought the bag from the front line. And the hole was covered with other people's shoes. Some were brighter, some were cleaner, some were newer than others. But the pair I held in my lap, they stood out from the rest of the Sweden shoe. This army pair was like from another planet. And I cried for the very first time since I received the boots. My tears started to roll down my cheeks and onto the shoes. And I got a cloth and I started to clean them gently, like I did two years ago when I received them in a post. First, I removed the mud from the soles, then I cleaned the rest of each shoe and I stroked them gently. And I whispered to them, good luck. You can keep someone else now, warmer and drier. Ой, ходить сонко, віко, а дрімота,
пятую рамку, блядь. Туман, нахуй, блядь. Да пиздец. Я же тут, блядь, три месяца мерзну, блядь. Коли же тут лето будет, я хуею, блядь. Туман. Вон там село, там противник, сепаратюги. И вот там, блядь, туман. Броник, блин. Тут нас... Тут нас пулемет. ДШК, блин. Да, Вон там туман, блин. Короче. Ну. Но... Патроны, короче. Тут мы шторку вишаем, чтобы. Чтобы они пулемет не бачили. Ну, ДШК. Тут укрытия у нас. Там, блядь. Там мы хуваемся, как что. Что-то прилетает, блядь. Тут укоп, блядь. Ну. Да. А самое интересное тут, вот эти капельки. Капельки, бачит? О, капельки. Вот что самое интересное. So, um, like I said at the beginning, I don't really like talking about what happened. It's mostly because I know that people feel that they have to react somehow, and they usually don't know how. I get different types of reaction, and I separate them into three main categories. Instinctive, intellectual, and indifferent. Instinctive can include anything from bursting into tears um, and offering genuine hugs to outrage and shock. I am so sorry. I'm so sorry. Stay strong. I can't believe it. It's absolutely shocking. Please let me know if I can help anything. Intellectuals, they're trying to explain the situation. They're trying to make me feel better in a constructive kind of way. But this is it. This is the price for our freedom. We are the front line for fight for freedom in this world, and this is the price. Yes, yes. Our country always demanded sacrifice, martyrs. It's awful, of course. But that's how our nation will get reborn. You know, everything ends, and this will end as well. Bacis? Така наша доля українців мусить пролитися кров, аби настали справжні зміни. Ну, шкода, що гинуть найкращі. And indifferent. They don't say much. They just say, ah, I see. It's probably because they don't know what to say. So they don't say anything at all. And all of these reactions are absolutely fine with me. But there is another category of reaction. The one that makes me regret talking about what happened. I met this young man, a writer. And he was telling me how he was suffering from writer's block because the war had affected him personally so much that he simply couldn't write. I simply can't write. And then he read one of his short stories to me in which he described some of his, some of his friends who died at the front line. And I asked him how he found the strength, the courage, the words to describe these things, given that he knew these people personally. You don't know how it feels to be so intimately involved in this war, you know, it's, it's hard to lose your friends. I agreed. You're, you're abroad, you know, you're far away, you, you don't know how it feels to be in the, in the middle of it all. I agreed. I just I didn't know what to do with this information, you know, it's, I don't think you can understand. I think I can understand. I know what it's like to lose someone. <laughs> Everyone knows how it feels to lose a, a relative. Yeah, but it's different from having one of your friends killed in a war. No, no, that's what I mean. I think I know how that feels. And then I told him. I told him what happened. You see, 
my brother was killed at the front line six months ago. And he's buried in the same cemetery as the guy that you describe in your short story, right next to him. I said it. I could hear myself say it, like I'm saying it now, like on the stage. I could hear my words in my head over and over again. My brother was killed at the front line six months ago, and he's buried in the same cemetery as the guy that you describe in your short story, right next to him. Yeah, that story it was uh, so hard to write. <laughs> he just continued talking about himself. And I immediately regretted telling him about what happened. It's like we were competing over whose grief was bigger. We were both preoccupied only with our own grief, our own stories. So here is the rest of mine. Ain't got no use for a little red rocking chair. I ain't got no sugar baby now. I ain't got no honey baby now. The first thing I thought when I saw him was that he looked like Lenin. He never looked like Lenin in his life. I thought I must be going mad. <clears throat> I suppose he had a high forehead and a little beard, like Lenin in those pictures, you see. I always envied his high forehead. I wanted to have the same, but mine was always smaller. I couldn't hold my head high like he did, proud, brazen even. When we were children, he rode horses, went to fencing classes, and swam really well. And I was acting in the theater and singing songs. I couldn't ride horses, fence, or swim. He was picking up languages, English, Polish, Dutch, just by traveling the world, just as thinking out with the people. And I had to learn my languages long and hard. He was a philosopher, even without trying. And I kept getting one degree after another, but anyways, I felt inadequate in his company. He was a talented artist, <laughs> when I couldn't draw even a stickman. He had an artist eye. Even at the front line, he noticed those frozen drops of rain on the branches. I admired him, resented him, feared him, <laughs> but always loved him, no matter what. And now I hated myself for thinking that he looked like Lenin. Why do we always think such stupid things in the most difficult situation? I was very scared of entering the morgue. I was scared of seeing the scars, the wounds, the fractures. And I had already read the protocol of the Medical Military Commission that came from the front line. Наскрізне осколкове поранення голови, розтрощення мозку, ушкодження внаслідок воєнних операцій, що стало причиною смерті. Поранення і причина смерті пов'язані із захистом батьківщини. A fracture of the head caused by shrapnel, the crushing of the brain, injuries resulting from the war operations that became the cause of death. The injuries and the cause of death are related to the protection of the homeland. End of quote. And I was imagining all of that in my head in some detail. My mom asked, um, uh, the commander asked my mom if she wanted to see the pictures 
of my brother's body, the way it was found at the front line. And she said she did. So he sent the pictures to her phone. The two of us looked at those photos together, first in silence, then wailing, quietly. So I prepared myself as much as I could for the mock. But when we entered, all I could think that you looked like Lenin. Fucking Lenin, honestly, it must have been his high forehead. asleep. His features peaceful. There was a little wound about his right temple. <clears throat> and a long scar across the head. But that was thoughtfully covered by the pillow. So we couldn't barely see it. that the uniform was brand new. And I thought, whose job is that to put the new uniform on that soldier's body? Those people, they are real heroes. I also noticed that the boots were brand new. And I thought, that's a shame for the new books, for the new boots to go into the coffin when so many people need them at the front line. And I just hated myself for thinking that. I held his hand. I stroke his face. I wanted to kiss his high forehead, but I thought he wouldn't like it. He wasn't that touchy-feely kind of guy. At least, that's what he wanted people to think about him. stood there, and I remembered when we were children, and he was picking me up from school. He hated picking me up from school. I really loved it, because, you know, when your big brother is picking you up from school, all the rest bo the boys could see it, and nobody would dare mess with me. And I would chat all the way home didn't say a word. <coughs> I think he didn't listen. But I didn't mind. I forgave him for not listening to me. I forgave him a lot when we grew up too. Sending cruel messages when the PTSD got the better of him. For not sending any messages for months. <coughs> for going to the army out of his own choice. getting killed. <laughs> I forgive him everything.
everything as I gathered the courage to kiss his high forehead. Here. Are those frozen drops of rain on the branches? You see this droplet? See this droplet? That is the most interesting thing here. You are becoming calmer and calmer. You are calm. You are completely calm. Every cell in your body is filled with calmness. All you can think about is rest. You enjoy the feeling of complete peace. You are calm. Ready? Aim? Fire! 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 Sorry, this is really not the right time. I understand, but maybe just some words. Yes. No, sorry. Oh, I see, I'm sorry. Oh, do you know that woman in the crowd? Is she the hero's mother? Yes, why? Oh, thank you very much. Great, it's even better. Um, so you used to service here, right? Yeah. Okay. Where are your friends? Mm. <coughs> Hard to say. He, uh, Kept himself to himself. Took me about six months to have a normal conversation with him. But uh, he was a good guy. You know, he was uh, he was free. Not many people managed to live like that. You know, free. Ohanyok, that was his call sign. Little flame. Yeah, did he burn out like a flame? Sacrifice everything for our country. What was your call sign? <laughs> Pacifist. Okay. Yeah, I was always a real pacifist. I couldn't wait to get home after I was demobilized. But he couldn't do it, you know? He was demobilized soon after I was, but he couldn't take it. He drank every day, went straight back. You, uh, you get these nightmares, you know? You don't get them on the front line, it's strange. How come, uh, how come you didn't get called up? Uh, well, yeah. Uh, that's a long story. Mm. Uh, yes. Uh. Hi. Yes. Excuse Hi. me. I was a hero's friend. Yes, I was his friend. Yeah. Oh, great. Could you please tell some words on camera? Um, sure, sure. Uh, <laughs> he was a free man. Not everyone managed to be that free. He was one of these real warriors who will continue to fight for our country, even in heaven. He wasn't a saint, but he was free. Thank you very much. Was it good? Oh, it was great. Thanks. He used to sing this song all the time at the front line. It really got stuck in my head. Ain't got no use for a little red rocking chair. I ain't got no sugar baby now. I ain't got no honey baby now.
day of spring. 